All right, so last day of the season, right? Last day of the semester. What do you think of that? Um, the exams went pretty well, and, and so I have them. We can pass them out at the end. I want to give the whole period to your questions. So if the ball is in your court. Yes? Do you think like the best thing to study is prior exams or homework or what? Hmm. No, that's a good question. I'm trying to think. I, I wrote most of the exam yesterday, but there's some things in it I want to change. And so, um, <coughs> I don't know. Um, I will go through, once you look at the prior exams, since we handed those back, look through those, that'll definitely give you an idea of what I think is important. Um, you know, look at at those written portions uh, to see kind of the, the things that I think are most important. You know, your skills in, in those uh, written portions, those open-ended questions, are the skills I'm most interested in, uh, like drawing an MO or what have you, or um, like MO diagrams, although y'all did pretty well on that. MO diagram uh, is pretty straightforward, so that's not going to be the written part. Uh, but um, I think understanding the bonding in a molecule is important, and one of the ways we understand bonding is infrared. So uh, focus on infrared spectroscopy, um, how to know uh, what vibrational modes are absorbing in what region of the spectrum, and so on. So uh, you know, think about that infrared lab that you did uh, with the benzene and the chlorobenzene. Think about the motions of the molecule. Like if you're down at the low wavelength or low wave number region of the spectrum, is that going to be a stretch or is that going to be a bend? So think about low frequency. Let's let's do this on the board. The frequency of vibration. It's got the force constant and the reduced mass. So if you're moving a lot of mass and there's some constants out front. Um, so I'll just do proportional to. You've got a single bond, double bond, triple bond. That increases your, your force constant, so that makes the vibrational frequency higher. So a double bond, if it's the same masses, like a carbon-oxygen bond. Single bond is going to be around 1,000 wave numbers. Uh, carbon-oxygen double bond, you know, from organic. Ketone. Aldehyde, where's that? 1600s, yeah. So we went from 1,000 to 1600 just by changing the force constant, same masses. Okay. Um, going from uh, an oxygen to, um, say, a sulfur, what's that going to do? Yeah, it's going to it's going to cause that frequency to go lower. So. Um, <coughs> And it's also square root dependence. So if you wanted to change the mass, also be, be ready to do these kinds of equations where you have nu1 over nu2 is equal to the square root of nu2 over mu1. If I change the reduced mass, this is the relationship. Now how did I get here? Well, anytime you have a proportionality, it can become an equals. by doing ratios. And if the force constants haven't changed, but the only thing that's changed is the masses, then you end up with this equation. Okay. Uh, I like these kinds of equations because they, uh, they emphasize that not everything's linear. I find that students from their you know, high school days or whatever are all constantly doing this, but without the square root part. They're like, oh, I changed mu. How does the frequency change? They'll just assume it's a linear relationship, that if I doubled the mass, I cut the frequency in half. But it's not that. It's a square root dependence. Okay? And so you have to take into account that, that the proportionality dependence of a power of one half. Okay. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. So what are the questions? So I would say, yeah, study those exams. Look uh, in particular at the different written parts. Um, focus on the infrared lab, uh, things like this.
Yes. So, uh, back on uh, exam six, you gave us a problem for something like ethane, some of the demos on that. Yeah. And I felt kind of off on that, so I'm going to go over something like that. Yeah, so drawing the, 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 um, the and pi and pi star bonds? Yes. Yeah, so the thing that I found most common in terms of people making mistakes on that. It's, I drew the I drew the molecule for you just to kind of set up the and it was uh, not ethene it had two chlorines on it oh yes so it was C2V which made the character table really easy there were no doubly degenerate modes or anything like that and so I wanted you to draw the pi bond on here and then probably redraw the molecule and draw the, the pi star um, so um, if you're going to just draw it on this molecule like this. You can draw the bond above and below the two carbons. So you've got it in this direction. And if you're looking at the at the coordinate system, that's in the x direction. It's the px orbitals that go into that into that pi um, pi bond. Redrawing the molecule. To make the pi star, you just swap the shading on one of them. And so that would be good. So either one of those would be good. What I found was that people left the molecule as is and then did this. Okay, but that's just two p orbitals bonding in a pi in nature, it doesn't show it on that molecule. And so that's not a good answer, okay? And didn't receive full credit. It received some credit because you knew, you were showing me you knew what a pi interaction was, that it was end on, okay? So that was worth a few points, but it didn't answer the question completely. Now, if you just said, okay, here's the molecule, here's the coordinate system, I'm gonna draw it from the side because it's easier, but you gotta rotate the coordinate system so that X is up now. Okay, so we rotate it around the y-axis. Where is z, just to be accurate? If I've taken this system and rotated it 90 yeah. degrees, z's gone into the board. And so that's also one of the skills I've been trying to develop in you, is the ability to move things and rotate things in your mind, because that's a valuable skill for chemists. We're talking about reactions and the molecule comes in here and it hits this carbon or hits this nitrogen. You know, you've got to be able to see in 3D and think in terms of atoms, ions, and molecules to be a good chemist. Okay. And so that's, that's the skill we're constantly trying to develop. We try to develop in organic uh, physical chemistry, also biochemistry, trying to see these enzymes with pockets and how the molecule lines up and goes into these active sites on an enzyme. The better you are at visualizing these things, uh, the better chemist you're going to be. Now the same thing if you were to draw then the pi star, you just make one of these out of phase. If you drew the coordinate system, that'd be x and y. So now I asked for the <coughs> Cartesian symmetry of these. So notice this is uh, changes sign as we go past the origin just like the x-axis. So it's got a positive side and a negative side just like the x-axis. Uh, the y-axis is the same as, you know, left and right. The z-axis is the same front and back. So this is going to have x symmetry. This one has this pattern of plus, minus, plus, minus. Just like the x times y symmetry. So this is not x comma y. This is x times y. It's the same symmetry as x times y. So that would be the, the x-y symmetry for the pi star. And then you go and look those up in the character table, and I can't remember exactly. I think X was B1 and this was B2, something like that. But whatever the character table tells us, or X is and XY, then that's going to be the symmetries that we use. And then you, from there, you're off to the races using the transition dipole moment integral to calculate the selection rules. You know, is there light that can cause the pi to pi star transition? And so then you would find a particular Cartesian uh, um, light, you know, whether it be X or Y or Z, <laughs> that could cause this to transform into that. And if you can't find one combination that's allowed at the end, 
then that's a forbidden transition. Okay. Now there's a, there's a tendency over this long semester to start to forget the terms that we use, like the transition dipole moment integral. Okay, there was a person on this last exam who'd been using that term this whole semester, and they got to that question, and it said use the transition dipole moment integral to collect, calculate the symmetry selection rules, and they blanked on that. They didn't know what that phrase, they drew something completely wrong because they just didn't clue in to what they were actually supposed to do. So that is the, you know, B1, B2, let's say it's this, you know, we got to find something in the middle, and so we're going to want to turn B2 into B1 somehow, and I don't remember how you do that. A2, okay, very good, and so this gives us B1, and then this gives us A1. Now, keep the brackets. There was also another person that dropped the brackets. You know, this also, this shorthand uh, is, is still representing an integral over all space. If you drop the brackets, you're not representing an integral. So this is still Dirac notation. We're doing integration here, but we're just looking at the symmetries of what we're integrating. And so then you would say this is A1, so therefore it's not equal to zero, and therefore it's allowed. Okay. So, you know, don't cut too many corners, right? The symmetry is, uh, the, the Dirac notation is simple enough. Don't cut it down any further because then it starts to lose its meaning. These angle brackets have meaning. They are telling us that we're integrating over all space. The symmetries are the symmetries of the functions that are being multiplied by each other. And so that's, we're just looking at the symmetry to see if the symmetry is going to give us a zero or non-zero result. Yes? We have our old exams, so we I do, yes. Yeah. So today's the last chance to get all your other exams because we've got a candidate visiting today. I've got a lot of meetings. So if you don't get them after class, um, they, we've had all semester to get your exams. So get them right after class and that way you can study from them. Okay. But if you can't find me the rest of the day, that's just, that's life. Okay. Yes. So on this class test, there is a question about like which would be better to find the ground states. You know, it's like a floating for fluorescent. Oh, yeah. Can you explain the answer to that? Mm hmm. Excellent. Okay, so that was a question on the vibrational parameters. Okay, so with vibronic spectroscopy, we had the excited state here, and we had the ground state here in terms of electronic spectroscopy. So that's the ground electronic state. And we call that X. And so in the iodine, this was B. We have A and B and C and it goes on up. But this is the excited. Okay. And so what we wanted to know was the vibrational parameters, nu E double prime and nu E X E double prime, or maybe I said just X E, but still the vibrational parameters with the double primes, meaning for the lower electronic state. From the iodine lab, uh, we actually had excitation in the first three levels, but let's just pretend we only have, uh, we've got a molecule with a higher vibrational frequency. So instead of 200 wave numbers, which is about what we have at room temperature, let's say we had a molecule that had a vibrational frequency of around 600 wave numbers. So we didn't have any excitation into the upper levels. So we only had the ground state. And so this goes up here and hits these levels. And so absorption tells you about the differences in the excited state. Because I'm starting from the same level here, B double prime equals zero, and I'm going to, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So if I take the differences in these peaks in my spectrum of the absorbance, this is the difference between this is actually, this the difference between two of those peaks is nu E prime. Because that's the difference between these vibrational levels. Once I convert it to wave numbers. Okay. And then this is another measurement. Nu E prime. And this is another measurement. Nu E prime. And the, they're not going to be exactly the same. 
And so what's the difference between this Nui prime and that Nui prime? It's anharmonicity. Okay. But the point is, on the absorbent side, I'm learning about the excited electronic state. Because I'm starting from the same point here and going to different levels up there. Okay, so the absorbance will tell us about the excited state vibrational parameters, and then there's non-radiative relaxation, and then a bunch of different emission events that give us information about the spacing down here. So the emission, it overlaps on the zero, zero sometimes, and then we have these differences, and so that's fluorescence. And so this difference is nu E double prime. So makes sense. Was the lab we did last week? I thought it was emission. The lab we did for the iodine was only absorption. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So we only did absorption because we don't have an emission spectrometer that that is tuned up for you know for iodine and so on. So we just did emission absorption. So we learned about the upper state. We got a little bit of information about the ground state because we had three different levels down here that were populated. So we could get the difference between zero and one and one and two. And so we could get, we could get um, this new E double prime value pretty well because we had lots of measurements of it. So we got pretty good statistics on this one, but we only had two of these. And so to find a statistically significant difference between them to get the anharmonicity in the ground electronic state, we, it wasn't statistically significant. So we couldn't tell if that difference was due to random noise or to a systematic change due to anharmonicity. Okay, so that's what that p-value is telling you. It's the probability that the difference between two numbers is just statistical noise. And so if that p-value is high, you can't say that it's a statistical trend. But if you get lots of measurements, you can say, wow, the difference between these new E primes, what's the probability that that distinct difference is due to noise in your data? It could be quite low if you have lots of measurements of it. So that's a great question. That's, and so I changed it up on purpose a little bit just so that you could look at this potential energy surface diagram. And what I wanted you to see was that the emission events all come from the same level up here, B prime equals zero, and go to different B double primes. And so that's giving you information about the differences down here in the ground electronic state. Yeah. So it was just asking you to make a critical thinking jump. Yeah. And now uh, we've, the ACS is telling us you've got to put more of that in the tests. So we had our recent review for the um, for the American Chemical Society certified degree, you know, the chemical, uh, the ACS certified degree. And they said, uh, in particular, they said, PCHEM, we want to see more critical thinking. Like they got drilled down to my test and said, we want to see more critical thinking. So y'all are like, crap. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was a critical thinking question. You know, you had, y'all did emission in lab. I asked you about, uh, y'all did absorption in lab and I asked you about emission on the test. So you can't memorize. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand and then apply. And uh, you, that's you're gonna have to do that in advanced inorganic and and uh, and integrated as well, and in your research. And then there's some of that in forensic chem too. So. Okay, we're turning you into scientists. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, the only information that we've really talked about in this class about the, the force constant strength is whether it's a single, double, or triple bond. And, and so we haven't drilled any deeper than that. So I wouldn't really have a theory for you as to what would make a, a single bond between, say, two carbon atoms and a single bond between uh, a carbon and an oxygen. If they're both single bonds, at this point, uh, I guess at a first approximation, you would say they're both single bonds, so they have the same K. And that the only difference in frequency would be based on their masses. Okay. 
So I don't have a theory for you, so you know I'm not going to ask you a question on that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I might ask you about, uh, you know, like a carbon-oxygen single bond versus the carbon-oxygen double bond. And so there you see the difference in the, in the double single bond uh, nature. I know I'm right with that, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it was based upon bond order. Yeah, so uh, you have single, you have one and a half, right? If it's a, if it's a odd electron species or it's a cation, uh, then you might lose half a bond order or you might gain half a bond order. And so I was taking you back to that one figure in the notes that uh, walks from lithium all the way to uh, fluorine. And you see the bond order go up, right? And you see the vibrational frequency go up just like that. You see the the uh, the bond length go down when you have a high bond order. The bond length shrinks. And so there's a there's a figure in the notes that has pretty much all four of those trends on it. Yeah. I can find those notes for you if you want me to. They're right here. Hopefully you've been watching the videos as we go and not trying to watch, um, you know, 32 hours of video. <laughs> <laughs> Straight through, yeah. That, I, I couldn't stand 32 hours of myself talking. I don't know how you were. <laughs> it might have been this one, local bond versus MO theory. Let's look at that. Nope. Swing and a miss. There it is. Okay, so this was... Uh, this was also good for those people who had questions about SP mixing. You can see the SP mixing in this in this level here. Let's let's go ahead and cycle through all these things. Uh, this this A1G here is is that sigma bond. That's the the p orbitals end on, and in nitrogen and lower, it's above the pi bond. And in oxygen and higher, it's below. Okay, so that's that. That's that trend that SP mixing causes that level to drop, drop, drop. And when it gets to oxygen, it's below the um, p orbitals, the pi bond. How would we do that experimentally? How would we know that experimentally by look t looking at the bond order of the cations, looking at the spectra, looking at the um, UV photoelectron spectra? And so then your question was about this next set of slides, was the bond orders, the bond energies, the bond lengths, and the, bond, the force constants or frequencies of vibration. And so you can see that you can, have, uh, you can have partial bond orders if you have a cation. So here's O2 cation. And the, the bond order went up. And here's N2 cation, and the bond order went down. So you see, you can't just memorize, oh, if I make a cation, the bond order goes up. No, it could go down. It depends on where the electron came from. If the electron came from an antibonding orbital, then the bond order got stronger, went up. But if it came out of a bonding orbital, then it went down. And you can see that in this previous figure. If I take an electron out of the oxygen, I'm stealing one out of a, out of a pi star, but if I take an electron from a nitrogen, I'm taking one from a pi. No, actually a sigma. But I'm taking it out of a bonding orbital, and so the bond order is getting weaker. You can look at the data, too, and the bond energy for O2 versus O2 cation. You take that electron out, the O2 cation, the bond order goes up, and so does the bond energy. Nitrogen is a triple bond. You take an electron out, it has two and a half bond, and so the bond energy gets weaker. The, Bond length is not too, I mean, it sort of bottoms out. You know, it can't get much smaller or much longer. But the force constant changes with the bond energy. So you can kind of see they, they really track each other well. So 
So here, up here is bond energy, down here is force constant. So this is the data that confirms our molecular orbital uh, theory pretty well. Now the only downside of the bond order is it's a little tricky to calculate for something that's not a diatomic. <coughs> okay, so. But this diatomic data confirms that our, our MO theory works really well. It's the cleanest case and so. Uh, we can use the molecular orbital theory for nonlinear molecules and, and get some good information. Okay, I don't want to ramble on, so next question. Yes? Did we get seven note cards or did we get an eighth for the final? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> used to. It was like four tests, right? So it was four note cards, which is, you know, a moderate amount of information, but now we got eight note cards. It's like it's an encyclopedia. I mean, I don't care because it doesn't really. So we do get Help like or hurt. I mean, another one for the final. Yeah, you can have a final note. You can have eight, three and a half by five note cards. You know, more power to you. Okay, you got half the half the class on these little note cards. Especially some of you that write small. You know, uh, but I, the point of the note card is to try to um, get you to condense a large amount of information to a backpack size information. You know. What, what am I going to take with me into battle? And, and you may have noticed what I noticed when my professors allowed me to do that, because a lot of times I got to the test, I didn't need it. You know, it was more like a safety blanket. But the, the, the beauty of making a note card is when you're studying. It's like, what am I going to put on this thing? How am I going to distill this down? Am I going to, you know, um, that's the exercise that the note card is for. And I've, you know, I've even given equations and everything on the test, and, and for the, the memorizers and so on, it doesn't help them. <clears throat> you know, having all the information, like having the character tables and the direct product tables and all of that isn't going to help you if you don't know what you're doing. So if you have eight, eight note cards, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you shouldn't miss any of the vocabulary. <laughs> I mean, yeah, seriously. Yeah. So. Yes. I try to. I try to bring stuff. Since it's comprehensive, I try to bring stuff from the whole semester together. Um, not only that, but it's a thrill when you get out and you're like, wow, oh, it's the whole way back to September. You know, and this was awesome. I've had people come out of this test like, that was exciting. <laughs> okay, one in 20 years. <laughs> But they were like, that was so great, yeah. And that wasn't like the student who made hundreds on everything, okay? This was a student that was like, you know, bees and kind of bouncing around. But when they went back and studied for the final, they realized we really were doing the same thing over and over again in different energy regimes, in the infrared and then in the visible and the UV. It was all about energy levels and, and spectral lines. If you can understand the energy level diagram, then you can tease out what's happening in the spectrum. So, and then once you have the spectrum, you can, if you can draw the energy level diagram, then you can tease out physical parameters about the molecule. What's the vibrational frequency? What are the masses here? You know, what if we did an isotopic substitution? You could do all of that information from the spectrum if you understand the energy level diagram. So that's the main point of the course. Because if I teach you that skill and they come up with some crazy new spectroscopy, uh, you'll be able to figure it out, right? So I'm giving you the skills to learn some new technique that doesn't exist yet. Because once you understand how to break things down to the quantum level, uh, then you understand the very nature of nature. And if they throw, you, throw at you a new measurement, it's, it's like no problem, you know. Hold my coffee and watch this. <laughs> Sanitize. <right? laughs> Next. Should we expect to double the length? Just double the yeah, it's not quite double, but it's it's close. Just to reduce the per 
question points value. Right, that multiple choices, whole semester has been five points a piece. I'm trying to get it down to around three. And so then, uh, and so then I'm, and I'm trying to keep the written part around 20 points or 20% of the exam. So, yeah. Yeah, it's been 45%. So I, I, haven't, I haven't nailed down the exact percentage yet. So I'm still tweaking. So I'm going to work on the exam a little bit more this morning and then finally um, Fisher Cup Bay, right? I'm going to make the decision and start photocopying. I'm trying to take into account this ACS recommendation to, to create more of a synthetic question. When I talk about synthesis, I'm talking about uh, mental synthesis. You take facts here and facts there, maybe skills in two different areas, and then you synthesize a new application of those. Okay. But don't be afraid. That's what the point of the course is, right? Understanding the spectrum, connecting it to the energy level diagrams, and then saying something about the molecule. That's the point of the course. Understanding the nature of nature using spectroscopy. And you can't understand spectroscopy without quantum mechanics. Uh, we, we're done with the integrals and stuff. We did all of that in the, the first lab and the first exam, so we're not going to be doing any, you know, straight up calculus, but we will do the symmetry selection. Go ahead. Let's go back to the, the integral. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's right. <laughs> Yes. Time symbols. Yeah, you'll, yeah, that's definitely a skill. Yeah, I'm going to ask you the term symbol for some atom. Okay. There still seemed to be some confusion on how to use that Klebs Gordon series. You know, when I wasn't happy with the written part of that exam. I mean, it's right here in the notes. That's the other thing, too. I, I'm, I'm worried sometimes that, let's see, atomic orbitals. I think it might have been because one was like zero, and that threw people off on like the absolute value bound. They got tricked, and they thought it was like three, two, one, zero. Instead yeah. Of three. Yeah. Okay. So the thing is, like, if we have a, let's just <clears throat> carbon. But let's do, um, I think I did an SP, right? I did. Um, it was like, I don't remember if it was zero and two. The carbon example is in here, but the, the carbon example is, is nice just because they're both P. Mm -hmm. and, and so L1 is equal to, remember, S, P, D, F, so P is one. And L2 is equal to 1. Okay? And so the thing is, that Klebs Gordon series, capital L, is this is a, is a numerical set. So go back to, I don't know what grade, eighth grade, when you started talking about even numbers, odd numbers, and things like that, you were talking about sets of numbers. And you had a minimum and you had a maximum. Okay? Or maximum and minimum. The maximum was L1 plus L2. So 1 plus 1, and the minimum was 1 minus 1, absolute value. Okay, so this is max and min. And so then this set is 2 and 0. And then it's, it's uh, subtracting 1 in between. So 2 minus 1 is 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. And so that's the full set, 2, 1, 0. So then... This is capital L, and in order to kind of keep things neat, we start using, we use letters for angular momentum. We call this a P, we call this a P. Uh, those are lowercase p's for the, the atom term symbol, we use uppercase. And so this is capital S, capital P, and capital D. So we have three terms, and then we're going to have the, the spins added in and the multiplicity. But this was the piece that was confusing people. I think we had like a, let's just do an excited state carbon atom where we had an, an S and a D. Okay, so if this is carbon, 
excited state carbon. This is ground state carbon, two electrons in the in the two p orbitals. Okay, now we've got a, a one in the three s and one in the three d. So <clears throat> crazy carbon. Okay, L one is equal to zero. L two is equal to two. Now one of these is zero, so our set's going to be very simple. Um, L. Let's see if I can get in this. Let's do control six. Control five. Okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, zero plus two. I'm going to do it this way so that you see the absolute value is really helpful. Okay, mm -hmm. zero plus two all the way down to the absolute value of zero minus two. The absolute value. So it could be a minus two, but you get rid of the minus sign and it's a plus two. So our full set is two and two. What's in the middle? Nothing. So our set is only two. Okay. So that's L. And so then for the letter for that, that's a D. If you can't remember, it's SPD, too. Okay. So then that's going to be our term for this. And if you think about it, this is angular momentum that we're capturing in this term symbol. One of those electrons is in an S orbital with zero angular momentum. One of those electrons is in a D orbital with two units of angular momentum. So for the whole atom, this is the only one it has angular momentum from. So it's going to be a D term. What about this one? Well, they have the imsabels that figure into the angular momentum. And, but you can think about this. Each one of these has a single unit of angular momentum. They can both add together to give you two. They can cancel each other out to give you zero. And then one can be sort of sideways and the other one up, if you want to think of it that way, in terms of the orbits around. And that could give you one unit of angular momentum. So it could be 0, 1, or 2 with two electrons in p orbitals. Um, so I did see some minus signs that people didn't capture the, the, the absolute value. And then let's do one that's even stranger. Let's do PF. <coughs> so now we have a carbon atom. Both of those electrons are excited. One's in like the... the well, maybe it's still in the 2p, but one electron's been bumped up into the 4f or 5f. It doesn't matter. It's an f <coughs> orbital. So we're talking about only the angular momentum. And so L is equal to, this one is 1 plus S, P, D, F, 3. Okay. 1 minus 3. Okay. So that's going to be 2. This is going to be 4. So our full set is 4, 3, 2. And so people, again, we're not capturing the max and min. You find the max, you find the min, and then you have integers in between. So this is L. So what are our terms? 2 is D. So S, P, D, F, and then G, and H, and I, and I. I'm not sure if it, they have a J because J is also a quantum number, and so it might skip J and go to K. But I do know it goes up to I. So S, P, D, F, G, H, I. So if you got up to six, it would be I. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I could, but I'm... <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, again, just capturing these terms. And then you go onto the S's, spin one half, Spin one half, so you have a half plus a half all the way down to a half minus a half. And, and so those are your S, that's your set of S values. And then J is L plus S all the way down to L minus S. So this could go for the G, it could go 4 plus 1 all the way down to 4 minus 1. And 3 plus 1 all the way down to 3 minus 1. And 2 plus 1 all the way down to 2 minus 1. So just review on term symbols. But the main thing was this Klebsch-Gordon series is, is the key to it all. And that is going from the max value to the min value and, and just integers in between. And almost always, with, well, with two electrons, you just have um, three terms. That's good enough. If you can do two electrons, you can probably hack your way through three electrons. All you do with three electrons, you do them two at a time. So you do this, and you get all of these terms, and then for the four, you add in one more electron, 
and then for the three, you add in another one, and for the two, you add in another one. And so you would do nested clutch Gordon series. You'd have one for this, and then another one for that, another one for that, another one for that. So every electron you add, you get three more, and then you get four more for the fourth electron, and five more for the sixth, and so on. It just it blows up, but it's the same skill. And you thought peak picking was tedious. <laughs> okay. Coming up with those term symbols for like a D5 system is ridiculous, but it's easy. It's just tedious. Yeah. So the difference between hard, uh, difficult and <coughs> tedious, you're now figuring that out. Difficult is conceptually difficult. I don't know what to do here. Tedious is I know what to do. What to do here? I just don't want to do it. <laughs> right. so, yes. So uh, one of the old exams. There was a question, and it's like, what set of four quantum numbers are possible? Uh, okay, I might answer it. So, okay. Because it's like are possible. Because like I was confused on the ML you put there, because you had to do zero for aluminum. Mm -hmm. And like from my understanding of P, it was like negative one, zero, one. Mm -hmm. And so I thought aluminum would be. Uh, actually, like, yeah, I thought aluminum would be negative one. But I guess because it says possible, it's like. Yeah, it could be any one of those. PX, PY, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. And since there's no energy level difference in the absence of an electric or magnetic field, it could be in the M sub L <clears throat> equals minus one, zero, or one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the PX, Y, and zero are totally arbitrary if there's no magnetic field. Okay. You know, so, so, uh, so we, you know, they would be equal energies. That's. That's kind of what we're calculating, though, with the spin orbit coupling is when that, when you would get some splittings. And so, how would you label those levels? You know, you put an electron in that that p orbital. We saw from the Gaussian calculations on carbon monoxide. I'm not sure if you saw it, although one person did their MO diagram that accurately in the test. Like they had the pz at a different energy than the px and the py because it had an electron in it. Okay, which it, the electron spin is coupling with the orbital spin, and so it's a slightly different energy. And so. When I said that they're the equal energy in the absence of a magnetic field, well, hello, an electron has a magnetic field. That's what spin is. It's intrinsic spin. So if you have a spinning charge, you have a magnetic field. So it's a tiny little magnet. And you put it in an orbital, and it's spinning either with the orbital or against the orbital, you know, like uh, planets. That's why they called it spin, although it's, it's all, there's a problem with calling it spin because... You, you think, well, where's the charge and how, what's the radius of the spin, right? And it's not really like that. But so you've got an orbital and you've got spinning with the orbit or against the orbit. So in this case, the magnetic moment is going up on the particle and up on the orbital. And so the two arrows are going in the same direction. This one, the orbital is going up, right-hand roll, thumbs pointing out, but it's spinning the other way, so thumbs pointing down. And so you got north and north together on this one inside, and north and south unpaired on the outside. So that's what we're talking about with the spins, and that's what these term symbols are calculating. So these are all of the combinations of all those little spins of the electrons in their orbits, coupling with each other or against each other. And there's going to be slight energetic differences because it is such a small amount, this electron spin. And so it's such a tiny amount, but it causes spin, spin, splitting, and your spectral peaks go poop and split into doublets and triplets. And that's what's explaining the atomic spectra. That's how we know we've got sodium there and not carbon because of the different spin, spin patterns, or spin over coupling patterns. So they call it hyperfine splitting. At the level of, uh, say, analytical chemistry, it's just how you label the peaks, right? And you go to the atomic spectral database, and you can say, okay, this is the singlet S0 level to the doublet P1 half level, or the triplet P1 half. Okay. Next. Seven minutes. Let's hear from the person too shy to ask a question. Put you on camera. <laughs> okay. No.
I'm going to call out someone randomly. So don't you dare. It's a breach of contract. <laughs> <laughs> All the eyes went down. It was great. <laughs> so we call somebody, and everyone's like, "We're gonna hide." Yes. No. That question was basis sets and things with Gaussian. That stuff's so easy to look up. There's no reason to commit it to memory. Um, You'll, you'll, you'll need it or you won't, and if you need it, you'll, you'll look it up and, and learn it by doing. I just needed it for that lab so that you could understand that we couldn't use the 6-31G star basis set for iodine because it didn't go up that high. It only went through Krypton, I think, and iodine's beyond Krypton, so uh, it wasn't in that basis set, so we couldn't calculate iodine. Nice, uh, um, Conveniently, Gaussian will tell you that. If you tried to use that basis set and you started that job, it would say, time out, you're supplying iodine, and it's not in this basis set. And so then we had to use the lanl 2 dz basis set. But to, to have you memorize all that stuff, it changes all the time. And it's kind of specific to Gaussian, which you might, there's other ORCA and games. There's a lot of other computational chemistry packages out there that uh, have their own terminology. So you would really just be memorizing stuff related to Gaussian. Can we expect hot bands and overtones? And mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Hot bands and overtones. What's the difference? Hot bands like that's like super wire, and then overtones like a different. It's like three different, five different. <laughs> Okay, I've got a vibrational frequency at 700 wave numbers. Where's the hot band going to be? Let's say there's no anharmonicity. Where's the hot band going to be? <laughs> Nick's like, man. <laughs> yeah, so 700 wave numbers is my vibrational frequency. Where's the hot band going to be for this molecule without any anharmonicity? A numerical value? You can answer this one numerically and be exactly right. Without anharmonicity, where's the hot band going to be? If I have a vibrational frequency at 700 wave numbers. What? 700 and 1? Why and 1? Because it's 1 more. It, it should be in plus 1. I, I why? Well, you, it's very close. You said 700, so you're saying it should be close to 700. Why wouldn't it be exactly 700? There's no inharmonicity. I have failed. <laughs> okay, what do you when you have a spectroscopic question? What do you do? You go to the energy level diagram. Okay, so no inharmonicity. I've got a parabola. Zero, one, two, Three exact equal spacing. What's the fundamental? Zero to one. That's the fundamental. That's seven hundred. Put a two there. Seven hundred. No anharmonicity. What am I saying by that? Equal spacing. What's the hot band? The hot band is one to two, two to three, and on and on and on. That's seven hundred and 700, and 700, all the way to infinity. So every hot band is going to be right on 700. There's no inharmonicity. So go to the energy level diagram. That's the skill I'm trying to like so beat into your head. <laughs> like you wouldn't know they're there. Yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> right? So now you'd see evidence because we do have anharmonicity, right? And so it would tail, it would smear to, to, um, sh to okay, these are getting, these arrows are getting shorter and shorter, mm -hmm. and we're, we're dealing in wave number, okay, so there would be shorter wave numbers, and so it would tail to the shorter wave, to the lower wave number values. Yeah, 
And so a hot molecule would have a tailing peak. You cool it down and it sharpens up and you get a really nice fundamental with no hot band interference and it's nice clean. Peak maximum is exactly where you would want it to be and it would tell you 700. Now where would the first overtone show up? Why are you starting at one? Yeah, so the first overtone, so this one right here, zero to, to one would be the first overtone and it would be 1400. Okay. Yeah, and then up here, so that would be 2100. What are you laughing about? Okay. Well, there be stuff about the PQ and R and the. Oh, yeah, 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 that's good stuff. Why does it sound like a decent idea? Okay, kind of like whenever you do the absorbance. Time! The absorbance and like fluorescence thing, it kind of reminded me. Like yeah, like only in that one we're seeing vibrational spacings, right? In the visible region, we're not able to, to resolve the PQ and R branches. They're there, but they're just too close together to see. So we get in the infrared, we see P and R branches, and the, the individual peaks are rotational peaks. In the vibronic spectrum, like iodine, the individual bumps are vibrational levels. Yeah. But they're like, so they're basically pretty much all the same things. Yeah, yeah. Always go to the energy level diagram. If you can figure that out, you can, you can pull it apart. <laughs>